All right, hello, hello everybody. Um, welcome. Uh, we can talk today about uh, Kubernetes SIG architecture and what it's all about and how you can uh, join in and help out. A little bit about who we are. That's me, I'm John Bellamera from Google. And uh, Dim's here, why don't you take over? I think you're... My nickname is Dim's. Uh, you can find me at Dim's on like Twitter, GitHub, and uh, the CNCF and Kubernetes Slack channels. I work for Amazon Web Services as a principal engineer in the EKS. Start by trying to, def some of this is like looking backwards, um, you know, where we ended up. Um, some of these were goals that were there right at the beginning. Um, you know, general purpose, portable, meet users halfway. So these are things that, this is why you're here, right? Um, you're here because we were able to achieve um, some of these goals. There is still a lot of things to do, um, and that's why we are here, uh, and the purpose of the SIG architecture is to serve as a space for the rest of the SIGs uh, in Kubernetes to come together to hash out, like, if there are technical decisions to be made, if there is uh, some options on the table between multiple six, how do we come to a single consensus, that kind of stuff. So that, these are the goals, typically, that guide our decision-making process also. Okay, so while we are going through the process of like doing the technical decisions, we often go back to the values that we've written down in our community, um, because it's the same, same, same issue, right? Like, how do we make sure that we are taking the right decision? Um, for example, if the tendency is to say, hey, every um, release, you have to do a certain thing, um, then do we do it manually, or do we automate out, you know? So it's automatic when we push a tag for a new release, then boom, uh, there's some stuff that is already done, right? So community or product or company, uh, that is very obvious. Um, you know, we work for, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, we compete for customers, right? Like he's working for Google, I work for AWS, and we are all always competing and cooperating at the same time. Inclusive is better than exclusive. Uh, one story I would like to tell is um, we have people who have been in the industry for like 20 years in IBM research. We also have people who are like in their first year at college, right? Like, so we welcome folks of all abilities to, you know, join and work in the SIG, learn from each other, and, you know, there is always somebody in the room who is, who knows more than you, and there is always somebody in the room that knows less, less than you, so you have to be inclusive everywhere. Uh, evolution is better than stagnation. Um, you know, if we were stuck with a bad call that we had made long time ago, then we need to figure out how to move out of it. Uh, the most recent example is we deprecated Docker shim, um, you know, but we did it in a phase controlled manner by sending information out to a whole bunch of people to say, hey, here is the set of things that you need to do, here is how you get out of it. And in the end, the Docker shim, for example, was hurting our progress because we were trying to support an extra thing built into Kubernetes that shouldn't be there. Right? Like if you just go to continuity project or a cryo project, you will see there, there are like 10 plus contributors, right? And we were asking every person who was writing a PR or a cap for Node to say, hey, now you are responsible not just for the things that you do in Kubelet, but also in the implementation, right? So that was a bad decision that we had made. So we try to evolve out of it uh, as well. So we don't stay stuck. Okay, so uh, how does this work? So how do we do our jo uh, job in the community? How do we, like, there is a process and there is groups that are associated with certain, certain things. And the way we work is, okay, CNCF is right on top. We are a CNCF project. Um, so the steering committee is responsible for, um, you know, anything that is happening with the project, right? Like if we need funds, for running a CA job on say Alibaba or you know, Azure or, you know, so we have to scrounge the resources, talk to the people responsible and you know, find funding, all those nice things that we have to do 
plus uh, the steering takes care of like policies for the, uh, you know, how we govern ourselves as well, right? So the steering is right on top. Um, similarly, the code of conduct and the security response team are right there with the steering committee. And under, uh, un under these, uh, uh, you know, on the top, uh, we have uh, special interest groups. We have, it's kind of like evident for some of these, uh, we, we have SIG architecture, which is us. Um, you know, two of us are chairs in, in, in the SIG architecture. We have one more person who is not here today. Um, but, you know, contributor experiences, making sure that we, en we reduce the burdens of somebody coming in with a PR, right? So that it, they can take care of that. Similarly, we have docs, release, testing, node, auth. You know, we have almost self-obvious stuff there. Um, so if you are interested in Kubernetes, you would typically come and work in one of these six. If you have something to do with uh, storage, then you go to SIG storage. Um, and then if SIG storage and SIG node are working on something together and they need to resolve something, then they bubble up to SIG architecture. So that's the way that works. Um, and we have you know, other groups that help us um, do our job regularly as well. So that's just an overview of the project itself, and now you know where SIG architecture fits into this whole, um, you know, Jenga puzzle. Okay, the scope of the architecture is SIG. So, uh, let me go back and a little bit uh, explain about like a charter, right? So, um, one of the statements I made just now was uh, the steering is responsible for everything, right, uh, in Kubernetes. Now I'm also saying that if anybody, if a group of people want to do some work and they want to define the work that they are going to do, um, then steering will delegate that authority and they'll delegate that area to the SIG, right? So we, we try hard to make sure that SIGs don't overlap as much, um, but, and they are distinct from each other. And the way we do it is by writing down what SIGs are responsible for, each SIGs are responsible for. So when we were doing SIG architecture, uh, a couple of things that we ended up saying was, um, you know, that'll be the group that will like collapse every, all the technical decisions upwards uh, as needed, but also we were saying that, hey, um, if um, there are multiple vendors uh, doing Kubernetes, then um, the look and feel for an application that is being deployed on uh, Kubernetes should be the same, right? We do that through conformance test, right? Uh, when folks want to come up with a new API for doing something, we do API reviews to make sure that, you know, uh, it looks right and there is, it's extensible, it's composable, it can like be updated uh, over a period of time. Like imagine, for example, uh, one problem that we had was uh, right at the beginning, we had one field called I, you know, IP address, and it was like IPv4, right? Then we said, okay, th there could be more than one, right? And they could also be IPv6, so how do we go to the point where you upgrade the cube CTL, you upgrade the kubelet, so there are so many, sig and then there is uh, things that are in the CNI layers we need to change, so how do we lockstep move everything forward um, because we have backward compatibilities, we have forward compatibilities. So that is the kind of things that we codify. Once we figure out like, okay, this is a bad pattern, then we write it down in the API convention, right? So similarly, we ended up doing uh, many more things and we are also, the last one is very important, which is how do we change ourselves going forward, right? That is, uh, we have enhancement proposal, in fact, the first proposal to the process was, what is an enhancement proposal and what does it look like, right? So uh, that, this is the scope of SIG architecture. Okay, uh, do you wanna do this? Sure, yeah. I can do this. Um, so uh, part of that scope is that we, or we, you know, we, we have a number of processes, so in order to, we, you know, we document the API conventions, but of course, somehow we have to make sure that people comply to those API conventions. So there's a number of processes set up by SIG architecture, and, and, and not just 
the two of us or the three of us. There's a whole bunch of other people who are partic participate. And um, so, uh, for example, the API review process, uh, whenever a contributor submits a, uh, a PR to Kubernetes, um, either in the main Kubernetes repository or using the Kubernetes group, um, then they're subject to these conventions. They're subject to this review process. So we have uh, uh, a bunch of people who actually look at those, make sure that they're using the proper naming, that they're doing things like uh, internally, you know, you need to use pointers to strings because you can't differentiate between an empty string and a null string unless you use a pointer. So, so there's a bunch of little, like really minute details that need to be reviewed and make sure that all of these APIs work consistently so all the tooling on top of them works consistently. So um, we're responsible for that process in this group. Um, additionally, um, sort of adjacent to that, as uh, a complementary to that are the deprecation policies. So we all know um, what happens when you go from a V1 alpha one to a V1 beta one to a V1 API. Uh, there's a certain uh, time scale and a certain types of notifications we have to do. So this group also manages that process as well as those, those policies themselves. Um, the, the production readiness review is an example of um, how SIG architecture uh, puts in place sort of um, uh, quality gates for the rest of, of the development within the organization. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a, in a moment. But effectively, sort of this slide or this, this, this set of processes um, supports that scope that, that Dim's showed in the previous slide. Um, of course, that said, we tend to be a catch-all. So whenever it's not clear, whenever there's um, disagreement among SIGs or within a SIG, the, the TLs or the leadership can't agree, um, they'll often come to us. We're not really an escalation point in that we have sort of the authority to say this or that. SIGs are quite independent. However, um, the people who tend to participate a lot in the SIG are very senior engineers. Uh, many of the people who started Kubernetes are participate in the SIG. Uh, and so um, people tend to come to us for guidance around those kinds of decisions, what's going to fall within those goals and those principles that Dim's talked about in the beginning, um, and make sure that, that uh, we're sort of staying within the scope. And it is within our, our purview to sort of publish those principles and, and require people to, to uh, sort of interpret those principles. So in that sense, we are, we are somewhat of an escalation point, but we, we kind of try not to be, you know, we don't, we don't want people to come to us because they're in a fight, um, which really hasn't often been a problem. Yeah. That's a big stick, and we don't want to use a big stick <laughs> yeah, too, exactly. too often, right? Exactly. It loses its power. So uh, operationally, we do this, those, those processes we showed are run by different groups of people. Those are sub-projects. So this is a typical structure in Kubernetes. Um, Dim's talked about steering committee, charters, SIGs. SIGs then take responsible area of scope. SIGs then have sub-projects, and sub-projects are run by individual people who um, actually make things happen. Um, we have um, these uh, five of them in, um, in SIG architecture. And I think we go into each of these, so I don't need to talk about yeah. it. Um, API review. Um, so I talked a little bit about this already, and if you want to jump in on any of these, yep. let me know. But um, essentially, uh, as I said, these individual PRs need to be reviewed. Um, and it ends up typically being somewhat of a, a deep design review as well, because often the API is so closely connected with the functionality itself. Um, and, and how you make that API. Uh, it's not just those little things I talked about, but it's really structuring the API in a way that's gonna be familiar to our users who are using all the other APIs within Kubernetes. Um, if you're interested in participating in this, it's really great. There's a shadow program. So um, we can, uh, uh, you know, you can go to any of these links. You can come to our SIG architecture on Slack um, or talk to us afterward, but we can uh, hook you up with the right people. Uh, essentially, you, you, you say, I, I'm interested in shadowing. You go in and you, you watch other people do these, these reviews, or you go in and actually you know, take a pass at it yourself and then get feedback from the people who are already reviewers and approvers. And 
And I actually will beseech you, if you're interested in this, to do it because while we have a good set, broad set of, of, of reviewers, we have a very, very narrow set of approvers. There are four people in the world who can approve Kubernetes APIs, four people. Three of them work at Google, and one of them works at Red Hat. That's not healthy. I'm from Google, but yep. I don't think that's healthy. I want more people. I can't, I can't go to you other companies and say, hey, bring people up to speed on this. Right. I can do that internally, and we're working on that too, but that's not going to help with that company right. imbalance. So. Uh, so the best way to engage is just come and uh, go to our GitHub repository and look at pull requests. There is a label called API-review. So that is where uh, the API re reviews uh, get triggered, right? And it just if you just watch it for a few weeks, you will get a sense of what is going on, who's doing what, how they are doing it, and then going through the two documents, the markdown uh, the, uh, files that you see there, it will give you a sense of like, okay, they faced this kind of problem before, so they codified a rule for making sure that we don't run into this, we don't paint ourselves into the same corner again and again. So, and then you can appreciate what we are trying to do here. And it's not just new APIs, it's also like they should coexist with the existing APIs. That is very important too, and it shouldn't like somebody is using this. Did somebody else write this? Right? Like, why is, does this look very odd? It, sh it doesn't feel like any other APIs. So consistency is very important to us as well, uh, so that you can see that we are trying to do the best here. Yeah, yeah, me too. Next one? Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you do this one? Yeah. So um, one of the banes of what we do here is Golang uh, comes up with a release every three months, right? Uh, like clockwork. Uh, so and they don't. They support only three going backwards, right? So we have to upgrade Kubernetes Kubernetes to newer versions of Go. And that's not the end of it. We have a lot of dependencies. Um, we depend on, it, it's, it's crazy. You can see the picture there, right? Like that's actually part of the picture. That's not even the full picture. Um, so what ends up happening is, periodically we have to revisit all the uh, Go dependencies that we use and say, see, if there are any CVS that have been fixed uh, in a newer release uh, or some performance enhancements that we need uh, uh, or some bugs have been fixed that has been troubling our users for a long time and we have to upgrade. And when you upgrade, it's not just one dependency you upgrade. The dependency typically have other dependencies. So we have to like manage the upward movement of all the dependencies as well. So uh, typical bottlenecks are like um, HCD dependency, when we upgrade, we run into trouble. The uh, open telemetry, we run into trouble. Like they had like 10 different packages that we needed to upgrade to, and it wasn't very clear which, which one works with what, right? So we have a number of people who just dedicate, including me, who just dedicate our time to code organization. Um, and we also do things like policies uh, for, uh, you know, uh, for the dependency management as well. We have tooling that we have developed which helps us figure out like what is the, uh, if you look at the graph of different dependencies, how much is the depth of the dependencies? How much is the breadth of the dependencies, right? And like when a PR comes in, is it adding more dependencies or is it dropping more dependencies? Like we are more happy to delete code than add code. Right? Because when we delete code, we end up throwing away the dependencies that only that code was using. So there's a whole team of people who just do this. Uh, and it's mind-numbing work, but very rewarding as well. Because what you end up doing is you end up talking to people from all kinds of uh, projects. Like uh, I have been able to talk to like open telemetry folks, container folks, HCD folks. Like, you won't even know um, the kind of folks that you will end up talking to and collaborating with. Uh, Microsoft folks on HCS Shim, for example. Um, so it is uh, a really good when, you, when uh, the effort that you take over, uh, some of these things, uh, when we want to drop like duplicate dependencies, um, you know, fork of one thing, but it's used differently by two different uh, uh, packages and things like that. It's, it's a very satisfying uh, thing when we get to the point where we actually reduce. Why do we want to reduce the, uh, the dependencies? It is because it's 
um, all the dependencies get into bi your binaries and the binaries bloat up. So when you add more dependencies, uh, it is very hard to upgrade dependencies as well as your binaries bloat. That is the reason why we try to prune dependencies as well. All right, enhancements process. Um, so as Dems mentioned earlier, we, you know, Kubernetes has grown into a very, um, not only a large project from the point of view of number of contributors and number of users, but of course a very impactful project. So changes to Kubernetes have the possibility to cause massive damage across the economy, frankly. So what that means is that we're way past, years past the stage of, you know, just willy-nilly, hey, this would be cool, let's add this, right? We, we need to be extremely cautious and mature uh, about how we uh, implement functionality within Kubernetes and really deeply understand the implications of those changes. So um, several years ago, uh, this process, this uh, Kubernetes enhancement process was defined in order to achieve that. And, Essentially what we do in this is every, um, you know, obviously if you're fixing a bug or something like that, you don't need to go through this process, but it's effectively a design review process. For any major change, for any major new feature, um, we, we work together as an open source community to gain consensus on that feature. Yeah, uh, one of the important things that we do here also is um, when a feature comes in, it comes in as alpha, right? Yes. A and then from alpha it goes to beta, from beta to GA, so we track the evolution of the feature, uh, and when you get to the GA, you can drop the feature gate, essentially, right? Like, you don't need the trigger, it's always on. But when it is an alpha and beta, it is good to have the feature gates to, like, toggle it on and off, depending on whether it is a development cluster, you're trying to do something new, or uh, if, you, if you want to push it into production, hey, I want, don't want to take the risk of an alpha or a beta feature unless I really, really, really need it for something. Right, yeah, right. yeah, exactly. So this, this is the process by which we come to the consensus is the by process by which we track. Every time you go through, through that, those stages, you're, you're gonna say, okay, I'm promoting this particular feature, which is this particular cap from alpha to beta, and it's gonna get some additional reviews. It's gonna, it's, there's certain criteria that are laid out that's, that's sort of like, you need to reach this. Uh, uh, the cap author says, I, before I go to beta, here's the things I expect uh, to get out of the alpha release, for example. So this is the process by which we do that. We have a sub, a sub, um, sub-project team that manages that process in conjunction with the release team. The release team actually sort of runs that process or runs, it encourages the authors of those caps to move them through that process. Um, but, but sort of defining what the contents, what the criteria are um, is, is done with, with this team here. Yeah. Uh, do you know why this is important? This is important because when you look at change logs for a release, you will see exactly what changed. And this is the process that gives that information to us. So we we have we would have written it down for you in the change log. Otherwise, you know, otherwise it's very difficult to yeah. track with the amount of PRs that is coming in. It's very difficult to track what is going, who is doing what, and like what do we need to publish to our end users? Like, you know, if you are if you have this thing on in your uh, cluster, do not turn this feature flag ever. Like you know, <laughs> like we yell at you and scream at you in the change logs. And that comes through this process. One other area um, that's the responsibility of cigar architecture is conformance testing. So if you go, uh, you, you know, if you look at EKS or GKE, we're all what are called, um, uh, we're all, we all have that K, and we are, all could use the name Kubernetes. So the CNCF owns that trademark, Kubernetes, and they have a process, and each one of us who produces a, uh, either a hosted Kubernetes or a distribution, we have to go and submit a bunch of test results showing that we comply with a certain set of conformance tests. So that process is run by the CNCF. I mean, we can only use the name Kubernetes if we meet those tests, but actually what those tests are is what the, the conformance subproject group decides. So we actually choose the tests that define what Kubernetes is and who can use the name Kubernetes. Yep. So over the... It also feeds into the enhancement process because when you go GA in the enhancements for a new feature, it better have a conformance test, right? Yes. Like otherwise, how will you know that it'll work exactly the same across providers, right? So, uh, you know, so we make sure that when people go to beta itself, they have 
a bunch of tests that will test the uh, conformance, uh, you may test the feature and make sure that it's working right. And when we go to GA, we turn on a flag that says, now this test is a conformance test. It must be run by a vendor, uh, by any vendor that wants, um, you know, a, use a trademark. Yes, yeah. exactly, exactly. Um, and so one of the things that we've been doing in this, in this uh, sub-project for several years now is we had a ton of technical debt. So we had a ton of functionality within Kubernetes that was tested but, but did not have conformance tests. It was not actually uh, subject, like wasn't considered part of what you must implement in, in order to be in Kubernetes. And so, um, and, and the conformance tests have to meet certain criteria because, for example, um, they, they have to run, be able to run across all these different providers, right? They have to be able to run across different architectures. Have, there's a bunch of, uh, a whole set of criteria. They can't rely on optional features. Like RBAC, in fact, is, we all use RBAC, but actually RBAC's not part of conformance because you don't actually have to turn RBAC on. And so there's some, there's some subtleties there, right? We, we, so um, we've had a team, CNCF hired a team of folks um, from II, it's a, 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 an organization out of New Zealand actually, and they've been churning away at, at that debt for a couple of years now, and we, in this, just the last, I think, week or two, We've gotten to like 96 percent. Oh, it's coverage. right there on yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is this, 90, uh, is this 95 point seven? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 95.7 percent. Yep. So this started at like 60 percent or something a couple of years ago. So yep. we put in place policies that said what Dim said earlier: if you go to GA and you're not an optional feature and you meet these certain criteria, you must have a conformance test. So we didn't dig ourselves deeper in that, but then we've been backfilling tests for for a couple of years. So we're very excited to see that that moving forward. Uh, reviews is the oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, then the last, I think this is the last sub-project we have. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah, production <laughs> readiness. I don't know what, what time it is, but. Uh, um, yeah, we can skip the rest. Yeah. <laughs> production readiness. So this we instituted a few releases ago. I think 1.21, it became mandatory. In that cap process, we added one more little gate. And this is, we get complaints, right? We're, we're kind of in a position where we're, we're putting gates on people and we're creating bureaucracy in their minds. But it's for the reason I said earlier. Like you check something into Kubernetes and it goes out to you know half a million clusters, you know, and, and all of a sudden nobody can, you know, all the planes are down for you know three days. That's a real problem. So we've kind of put these gates in to make sure that developers are doing what what they're supposed to do. One one of the things, and we're both software engineers, we know, right? You're, you're building your feature and you're excited about it and you're thinking about all the happy path and you're thinking about how's it going to work going to work great and it's going to do all this great stuff for people but often people lose sight of those unhappy paths so production readiness is just a simple set of questions that we added to the cap process where we, we we make people think about all those unhappy paths we make people we ask them the simple question of how do I turn this thing off if 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 it's not working right and we make sure that people actually have implemented those feature gates properly. I mean, it's not a police force. It's really we, we trust our SIGs. We trust our people that are building things. But it's just to, to make sure it's documented for users to make sure that they've thought it through. Um, so having now uh, this actually mandatory for the last um, uh, couple years, we every year do a survey. And I'm very happy to say that in our most recent survey, uh, we asked, is Kubernetes more reliable than one year ago? And Three quarters of the operators, cluster administrators out there that, that responded to the survey did say yes, uh, and another 20% that said they're not sure. Just a tiny little percent said no. So we we're very, very, very happy to see that that sort of result. Yeah, um, yeah. Let's skip, uh, we run short of time. Slides will be posted for sure. So you know, check three slides that I skipped over. How to participate? Um, you know, come to the main SIG architecture meeting come to the sub-project meetings that you are interested in. Uh, there are project boards, mailing list, Slack. Uh, there's one URL. You can find the information for the rest of the things. Uh, we, we would like you to ask a question, any question. It doesn't matter. You know, All of us started at one point or another, so we don't judge you for the question that you're asking. Please speak up. Please ask. Please ask how we are doing things and why we are doing things, and we'll be happy to walk you through uh, things uh, like another example that uh, John was already talking about was uh, some of the shadow programs that we are running, which are really good for uh, you know both uh, you know beginners who are just trying to learn 
what we are doing as well as experienced people who will then turn around and do it and use it for their own projects as such. So um, yeah, and, and I'll say that some of those, so, so API review, for example, that's gonna probably require quite a bit of knowledge of Kubernetes and APIs and all that. But like production readiness, actually a, a great profile of a person that's doing that is an SRE, right? That's somebody who's, who's they don't, you don't need to know the Kubernetes code, you need to know what it's like to have 10,000 clusters right. and, and have something broken somewhere and you don't know what it is and how to find it. Right. Right? That's actually the kind of viewpoint we need. And, and so right. coming, coming to those. Uh, and uh, Kate's uh, uh, code organization, right? In code organization, all you need to do know is, uh, do you know how, Golang, do you know how to compile? That's it, right? Like if you have to move, update um, a dependency, we have written down the steps. All you need to do is like figure out like which dependency you have to upgrade and what version you need to upgrade it to and run some scripts and push it push the PR uh, and the CI jobs will yell at you if it goes red and then you iterate right so if you just know go that's good enough for you to start with in messing around with the um, you know code organizations uh, sub project okay so thank any you questions any questions. Okay, thanks a lot. We'll be around for a few minutes. Thank you.